Ronald Reagan was asked back in the 1970s how he could deal with the seriousness of the Soviet Union as it seemed to be making inroads into country after country around the world. And he said, uh, it's simple, uh, we win, they lose. Keeping our republic is on the line and it requires patriots with great passion, dedication and eternal vigilance to preserve our freedoms. Jenny Beth Martin is the co-founder of Tea Party Patriots. She is an author, a filmmaker, and one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world. But the title she is most proud of is mom to her boy-girl twins. She has been at the forefront, fighting to protect America's core principles for more than a decade. Welcome to The Jenny Beth Show. Imagine having a front row seat to the pivotal moments in the Ronald Reagan era of American politics. Today's guest, former Attorney General Edwin Meese III, doesn't have to imagine it because he lived it. Ed Meese was a trusted confidant to President Ronald Reagan, playing a pivotal role in shaping the policies that defined the Ronald Reagan era. His influence extended from the governor's office in California all the way to the halls of the White House. As Attorney General, he led a robust fight against drug trafficking and addiction, reducing drug abuse in the United States by over 50%. In this episode, Ed shares his incredible journey from debating and public speaking in college to becoming the Attorney General of the United States. He recounts his first meeting with Ronald Reagan, his role in developing the Strategic Defense Initiative, and his pivotal part in the Reagan administration's efforts to bring down the Soviet Union. Beyond his career in public service, Ed has continued to shape American conservative thought as an elder statesman in the conservative movement, working with the Heritage Foundation to promote policies rooted in individual freedom, free markets, and limited government. Stay tuned as we dive into this remarkable legacy of Ed Meese, a man who has not only witnessed history, but also shaped some of the most significant moments in modern American history. Ed, thank you so much for giving me this time to talk with you today. I really appreciate it, and I'm just so glad we're able to do this. Thanks well, for being here. Very happy to talk with you. So you were the Attorney General of the United States and an attorney. How did you decide to be an attorney when you were a young man? And did you ever imagine when you, when you, did, when you made that decision that you would one day become Attorney General? Um, I, did, I decided to go to law school. Um, I had done, in college, I had done a lot of debating and public speaking. And so uh, I thought that, uh, and also studying public policy. So I thought that a law school education would be very helpful no matter what I did. I was thinking particularly of going into work like uh, city management that sort of thing. And uh, law school seemed like a very good follow-on from my studies at, uh, as undergraduate work. And you were a very close advisor to Ronald Reagan. When did you first meet him and how did you become such a close advisor to him? It was funny how I met Ronald Reagan. Uh, I was in the district attorney's office in Alameda County and my boss, the, the district attorney, was uh, uh, the chairman of what they called the Law and Legislative Committee of the Peace Officers and the uh, District Attorneys Association. So uh, in essence, he represented all the law enforcement agencies, chiefs of police, sheriffs, and district attorneys. And um, one of the jobs there that he had uh, was to represent uh, these organizations or these uh, different groups before the state legislature. And so it was uh, tr traditional that each year when the state legislature in California met, uh, one of his deputies would go before the state legislature representing him and these other organizations. So it just, it happened that in 1961, it became my turn to do that. And so I'd spent the whole uh, session of the, of the legislature, which was six months, um, discussing legislation 
with uh, various members of the state legislature. And uh, uh, so that was in 1961. In 1966, when Ronald Reagan won the election and became uh, the governor of California, he was assembling his staff because he was starting, uh, obviously, uh, from scratch because he had never been in, in government before. And so uh, one of the things that he was doing was going around the state, literally uh, asking people to serve on his, on his staff. And uh, I, I was... Um, he, he, he was, uh, I, was in, in, I was invited to come up to Sacramento and to meet the new governor, and so I did that. And when I met him, we had a conversation for about a half hour, and I was so impressed with him uh, that uh, when he surprised me at the end of that half hour talk with each other, um, I was, he surprised me by offering me a job as his legal affairs secretary. And I surprised myself by accepting. <laughs> and I remember then driving home 75 miles to tell my wife that we would be moving. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you were so impressed with him. What impressed you in that meeting? Well, his friendliness and also the fact that he knew quite a bit about the criminal justice, which was something I knew a lot about because I would, had been a deputy district attorney at that time for, for several years. And so uh, it just just happened that I'd say, he, see, he seemed to be the right person that I'd like to work for. That's great. And then what did you do in that first position with him? I was his legal affairs secretary for about a year uh, and then, uh, then uh, t actually about two years, and then when the when his chief of staff uh, uh, left office to uh, become a judge, he asked me to take over as ex assistant executive assistant and chief of staff. And so you had a lot of responsibility for him as governor during that time. Well, that's right. I was. Uh, did that for about six years wow. through the rest of his term. Um, during that time, there were a lot of anti-war protests going on against the Vietnam War on college campuses, right? That's right. What happened with that? How did you and President, or at the time, I guess it was Governor Reagan, handle right. that? Uh, Ronald Reagan understood the right, right of the protesters to present their, their arguments but he also felt that they should not do that in a way that literally closed down the, the colleges and interfered with the kids who wanted to get their education and the teachers, the instructors that wanted to teach. And so he took action to open the colleges, but at the same time allowed lawful protest uh, without uh, interfering with with what was going on on the campuses. And there are similarities, aren't there, right now with those kind of protests and what we're seeing with the anti-Israel protests today on campuses. And a lot of those are actually shutting down campus. They've canceled graduations for some of the students. It's, it, it, it isn't what you're describing that Reagan did during that time. Well, that's right. Uh, too often today, the officials at the, at the colleges uh, have uh, almost been intimidated uh, by the student, uh, those who have gone beyond protests and were actually engaging in uh, uh, rioting and other action that has essentially kept the colleges from doing their job of educating and uh, uh, young people cannot get to their classes, and uh, uh, faculty members could not teach. And so in essence, it was a, a, a riotous situation in many campuses. And, and that, 
that is not how it's supposed to be. And Reagan made sure that is not what was happening back during the, the Vietnam protest. Yes. Uh, so Ronald Reagan uh, felt that the business of education should continue and not be thwarted uh, by the students who had literally turned this situation into a riot and were vandal vandalizing buildings, uh, trying to start fires and that sort of thing. And so he took action to make sure that, that the campuses got back to their business of teaching. And uh, in one campus, even to the point of having to uh, uh, mobilize the National Guard uh, to stop the damage that was being done, not only to the buildings on the campus, but also to several of the stores and breaking the windows and, and breaking the glass uh, in the fronts of the buildings of the stores, that sort of thing for, for those uh, uh, buildings just out, outside of the campus. It, and I think that it's really important what you're just saying. There is free speech and the right to speech and the right to protest your government. And then there is crossing a line and destroying property. And we don't have the right to do that. And students, whether it was back in the Vietnam protests or people who are protesting against Israel and for um, Hamas terrorists right now, you, you can express yourself, but you're not allowed to destroy property and shut down the, the business of education. Oh, that's right. And not only was that, it was not only destroying property, but also beating up on students and that sort of thing to try to keep them from going into class and uh, getting back to the business of learning. And I think that it's important for people listening and watching this podcast and seeing the news of the day right now to remember that even though some of what we're seeing right now, like with the protest about Israel, um, it, it's not new in the history of America. It, it's a different theme and a different topic that they're protesting about, but the, the same kind of things happen throughout the history of our, our country, and we need leaders who can focus on what is a right versus what is, is moving over beyond a right to criminal activity, and being a leader and taking a stand to distinguish between those. That's right. It, it, the Ronald Reagan felt and rightly so, that there's a big difference between lawful protest and property damage and actually uh, hitting, uh, hurting people. Absolutely. To, to keep them, those people who wanted to go to college and get an education and were not interested in protesting. Then let, let's shift from, from that. So you worked for Reagan for two years um, and then six years, and six years as a, the chief of staff. And then he ran for president, right. right? And he had a failed campaign, and then he ran again in 1980. What were you doing during his first run for president, and then what did you do during his second run for president, during okay. the campaign time? Yeah, during his first run for president, I had, uh, at that time, was in, involved in business. I was the vice president of a an aerospace company, and then I uh, left the, that job to work on the campaign in 1976 and uh, went into law practice then at that time and was in law practice. And then in, when he ran again in 1980, I was uh, worked full-time on the campaign and uh, served as, as chief of staff ultimately of the campaign for the last year before he uh, ran and won in 1980. And um, I would imagine that when he ran and won, he was running against an establishment person, really. He was running against George H.W. Bush. And I, I'm sure that the establishment forces were probably against him, very much like the kind of establishment forces were initially against, and maybe are still against, uh, Trump running running today. It seems to be a recurring theme we, we conservatives have to deal with. Yes, it seems 
very similar uh, to 1980, uh, it was very similar, if you will, to uh, 2016. And uh, the circumstances uh, in terms of treatment by the establishment in, in the Republican Party and, of course, the uh, Democrat Party as the opponent forces in the campaign. So uh, he really, Ronald Reagan had really a very distinctive campaign in uh, 1980 and uh, ultimately won in the, uh, in the campaign, in the primary, and won, and uh, then went on to win, uh, surprisingly by some, um, as, he went, as he won the general election and took over and really made the uh, Republican Party a, a much wider and a better party uh, in terms of uh, bringing in a lot of people who had not been involved in politics before. And, and Trump <laughs> is doing that as well. Yes, Trump had his own, own style, very different than Ronald Reagan. But it, but it was his own, and the circumstances, as I mentioned, were similar. Right. To the uh, concerning the, the way in which the uh, so-called establishment uh, treated him, uh, very negative. As a matter of fact, there was a, a, a massive group originally in the in the primary campaign, uh, people like Howard Baker and and uh, besides George Bush and uh, Phil Crane, uh, there were about five uh, uh, other candidates in that campaign initially. And then, of course, Ronald Reagan won ultimately in the primary voting. And then he went on and became president, and right. you moved from California to right. Washington, D.C. Uh, yes, when he won the campaign, then uh, he asked me to be his counselor, which is a, the kind of the uh, policy, chief policy person and his staff. And uh, then uh, that's, so at that time we, we moved to Washington and then he uh, asked me to be the attorney general when that opened up and I accepted and served for the second term as the attorney general of the United States, and uh, then ultimately, uh, uh, when the campaign was over, shortly before the campaign was over, uh, I also then was asked to take a position with the Heritage Foundation, which was one of the leading uh, public policy so-called think tanks in Washington, D.C., and uh, actually founded the uh, Center for Legal and Judicial Policy. And what did that center do? And that center was actually uh, a, a research uh, center on uh, uh, legal policy and, and judicial policy and other similar uh, type of work, uh, working uh, to, to uh, support uh, sound policies on law, uh, judi the judiciary, and uh, similar matters. During your time working first as counselor and then as attorney general for President Reagan, what, what are some of the things that happened during that time in your position that stand out as most memorable to you? Uh, during the time that I was attorney general and even before when I was counselor to the president, the most important issue that we dealt with was drug trafficking and drug addiction. And that was the number of young people, particularly who were getting involved in drugs uh, to the uh, detriment of their own lives in many cases. And so actually Ronald Reagan developed a strategy of dealing with drugs that was five points. Uh, one was, of course, strong law enforcement to stop the traffickers. Uh, secondly, 
international cooperation because a lot of the drugs were coming from outside the United States. Uh, a third was uh, treatment and rehabilitation for those already using drugs. A fourth was, was the prevention and education to stop people from starting. And a fifth was uh, expanding research on the drug problem and how it can be prevented. And as a result of that, literally from 1982, when this strategy was, was started until 1992, and it continued on into his successor's time. But during that time, drug abuse in the United States was decreased by over 50%. And so I would say that was probably the most important thing we dealt with during that time. That's really amazing. And I grew up during the 80s, so I was a um, young girl and then a teenager during that time. And I remember Just Say No right. and the advertisement with the frying pan and this is your brain and, and the egg, this is your brain right. on, on drugs. Right. Um, but it, it had a lasting that education effort had a lasting impact because here we are year, decades later and I can still rattle that off and anyone from my generation and older remembers, remembers those campaigns. That's right. Unfortunately, after around the 1990s, the effort on drugs was not continued and expanded as it was during the Reagan and, and early Bush years. And so, as a result, we still have a drug problem today, and only it's today, actually, it's even more serious because of, of the uh, deadly drugs that are often involved and uh, have taken the life of many young people at this time, uh, even more so than they, the uh, deadly aspects of drugs that was started out in the 1990s. Yes, fentanyl is such a real problem today, and such a tiny little amount can right. can it can have devastating consequences. Yes, uh, fentanyl is of course a deadly drug that's often mixed with other drugs, and as a result, people don't know what they're doing to themselves until, in many cases, they they've gotten seriously ill or ultimately actually die. It's and it's heartbreaking. I've met a couple of parents just in the last year who who have lost a child. Um, a child has died due to taking drugs, and the drugs were laced with fentanyl. Right. And it it just it's it's heartbreaking to know that this is happening. It is, and uh, many of the drug many of the uh, parents who've lost children through drugs and through the fentanyl uh, have. Uh, really testified to the dangers of this particular drug and the particular drug situation today, which is uh, equally serious to what we dealt with back in the 1980s. How important was the Strategic Defense Initiative in bringing down the Soviet Empire, and, and what did you see during your time about that? In the early days of his presidency, he met with Dr. Edward Teller, and was given the ideas and continued with some of the ideas he had had before that a missile defense was really possible, uh, even utilizing uh, weapons in space where a missile could counter a, an incoming missile and actually make uh, nuclear weapons obsolete. And this was something that he then proceeded to uh, challenge the Joint Chiefs of Staff to uh, work on it, as well as the people who were working on it from the private sector at the various universities. And as a result, he was able to announce in 1983 uh, that we would go ahead on what was called then the Strategic Defense Initiative. Many, there were many uh, gainsayers who would said it could never be done. 
and yet here today, some uh, uh, several de decades later, we've just gone through a period where the Iran government launched literally dozens, if not hundreds, of missiles, missiles uh, at uh, the country of Israel. And uh, it was uh, pretty well thwarted by the Iron Dome and other anti-missile weapon and weaponry, which shown that what Ronald Reagan started in the 1980s was not only successful, but it amazed everybody on how it saved many hundreds, literally hundreds or thousands of lives and proved the validity of the whole anti-missile defense theory that Ronald Reagan had begun. And when I was a kid, I remember the news would, they seemed to make fun of Reagan for his Star Wars program. And yet that very kind of program uh, is why Israel still exists right now today after right. the attacks they just faced. That's true. Our continuation with uh, developing uh, uh, weapons to counter nuclear weapons will cont is continuing uh, in this country. If it had been continued at the rate in which Ronald Reagan started it in the 1980s, it would be, I think, so successful today that it really was would make nuclear weapons obsolete. Unfortunately, certain, some presidents since that time have not had the confidence in it, in this program that Ronald Reagan did. And so it's important that we go back as a part of a, lead, a new leadership in our country to the continued development of the highest possible way uh, to develop, to expand the concept of nuclear defense. Um, Reagan is often thought of as one of the best presidents in, in our history, and, and we put him on a pedestal with George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Um, but you knew the man, not just the, the, the mythical figure that, that I know, because I never met him. What are the things that impressed you the most about him? And as you were working in his, in his administration, could you see his legacy playing out? Uh -huh. Well, the one thing, of course, that I saw right from the very first time I met him was his friendliness. And uh, then as I worked for him over that period of time, from the, the 1966 on, I worked for him in one way or another. Even after I uh, left the uh, government when at the end of his term, uh, when he left the governorship, I was on his advisory committee that worked with him on a number of things. And then, of course, and I'm currently uh, co-chairman of the Board of Governors of the Reagan Ranch, which was taken over by Young America's Foundation when it looked like it might be sold off to, to uh, uh, entrepreneurs who would uh, essentially destroy the ranch as the way Ronald Reagan had kept it. And uh, it, is, it is now a great uh, picture of the simple life that, and the branch, the outdoors life that Ronald Reagan prized so highly. I spoke there after the targeting of the, the IRS targeting of Tea Party groups, of groups with Tea Party and Patriots in their name. They invited um, me to go speak there, and Jordan Seculo, Jay Seculo's son, and I were on a panel discussion. And I remember just sitting there and, and talking about the topic at hand because I was asked to be a guest speaker, but thinking that it was just so amazing to be on, on the property of his ranch and to see his home and to see this beautiful, beautiful property. The ranch really portrays Ronald Reagan as he was. He enjoyed the simple life of being a rancher and he spent much of the time uh, 
doing work around the ranch and uh, so on after he uh, left the presidency and really up until the time that he passed away in 2005. His legacy is one of stopping the Cold War, of ending the Cold War and bringing down the Soviet Union and, and working to stop the spread of communism. Um, my daughter and I, she's 21, she has a twin brother. She and I have been watching a TV show set in the 80s recently, and she is trying to understand what it was like during that time, during the Cold War. What would you say to people, young people today, your, your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren who have no concept of, of what that period of American history was like? Well, I think you would have to explain the 80s were very much like the situation it is today. There were, well, there was a, actually, when Ronald Reagan became president, we had just gone through a, a period of high inflation, a stagnant economy, and the Soviet Union was, was uh, threatening uh, the United States and all the free nations. So you had a bad situation uh, in terms of foreign policy as well as domestic policy. And Ronald Reagan actually also faced the fact that many people had given up at that time on America and were thinking that perhaps our country was not able to provide the opportunities and to have the kind of a, a growth uh, and uh, a way in which Americans could do everything uh, and successfully and be successful if they worked hard. So Ronald Reagan really had three major things that he had to deal with. The Soviet Union threat as foreign policy. Uh, secondly, the work at home and economics to do something about inflation and the bad economic situation. And then the third thing was to re renew the spirit of the American people when he left office. All of those things had been accomplished. The thing, the situation was had been set in motion, which ultimately led to the implosion of the uh, of the Soviet Union uh, and the end of the Cold War. We had a new period of economic growth and uh, lower inflation, and he had restored the feeling of America that America was a land of opportunity. Young people should see what was happening, what happened in those days, and which Ronald Reagan's uh, meeting the challenges in the 1980s are similar to the challenges that we have today. And all we need really is the proper leadership that we've had in some cases, but not recently. I, I think that's right. As you were describing the challenges that he was facing, a stagnant economy, hyperinflation. Um, we have a rather stagnant economy and we're dealing with inflation, maybe not hyperinflation, but certainly inflation. It affects everyone when they go to buy groceries. Right. He um, was dealing with the, the rise of, of the Soviet Union and, and their power and the threat that their power might have on America. And we have that coming from communist China today. And then the spirit of the American people is is very low right now. And people think the country is in terrible shape. And, and the same thing was going on back then. And with the proper leadership, we can get out of these problems. Right. That's what we need now. And after p periods of really a total lack of leadership or uh, leadership in the wrong direction, which we seeing at the present time. When Reagan was president, did he ever consult polls to figure out how he should talk to the American people? He was such a great communicator. Yes, uh, he, he uh, looked at polls to see how, how we were doing uh, in the election, for example. Um, but he was not, he saw that as a, as a, a uh, so an indication, really, of how the people felt 
but he did not use those, for example, to uh, so much uh, as often people uh, p people in politics do, and then set their course the way the uh, the polls indicate people are thinking. Ronald Reagan had ideas about America that carried on the traditions that he lived by as a small as a young person, and really the basic principles that our leaders over the years, going all the way back to the 1770s, uh, the kind of the leaders of, of freedom and uh, industry and in, uh, industry in the sense of hard work and that sort of thing. Um, and so he restored those kind of concepts like uh, st strong national defense, uh, uh, individual liberty, uh, the uh, idea of free market economics, uh, and the, and uh, limited government, those kinds of principles, which uh, he uh, on which he built really uh, his plan and his strategies, and which were successful in as I mentioned foreign policy, uh, domestic, particularly economic policy and uh, preserving the freedom of the American people. All of those things which we need a reiteration of today. And when, um, wh how would you talk about it today to remind people why that's so important today? Well, I think we would see that we could again build the, a country or preserve a country as we did uh, in the, the 1980s uh, there where we really had uh, peace and prosperity, which lasted in the 90s, uh, the 80s, 90s, and uh, for quite a while, but which in the last uh, decade or so has, uh, with the exception of the Trump years, uh, we've had uh, a major uh, deterioration, uh, both before and after the, the Trump years, the Trump years was a respite and a growth period and a uh, foreign policy would have been the, that involved essentially peace through strength, uh, which unfortunately we have not had before and since uh, that policy. And that's the job that remains to be done and uh, one in which uh, there's a great opportunity if we get back to those Reagan principles and what uh, President Trump did during his time, if we get back to those, what, whether we do or not really depends on the next election. That's right, and the American people. Um, and you, you said uh, personal freedom, individual freedom, limited government right. and free free markets. Right. Um, how, how are those so important? Why are they so important? Well, is free markets and individ individual liberty, well, it means that people can work hard uh, and be successful and that our businesses and industries are successful and that we have people being able to, to improve their economic situation as they did in the 1980s, uh, in the 1990s. And also, we can do things like the reduction of crime. Uh, crime went down from 1992 down to 2015. Unfortunately, uh, during the latter part of that period, in the years around 2000, and uh, 2010, a lot of people, particularly in our universities, uh, were preaching an idea that we didn't need to put people in prison. And uh, as a result, crime, in around 2015, crime started to go up again and has continued to go up since that time. And, and that is harmful to everyone because when you have, have crime happening, you, 
businesses are less likely to go in areas where there, are, where there is high crime. They may wind up closing businesses if there is high crime. People are harmed physically and also with their property. And, and it creates an uncertainty and an, um, it, it, I think it leads to that feeling that the American people have, that they just begin to give up on America rather than to feel like there's something worth, worth looking forward to. Uh, today, when some of our political leaders are even at the point where they're, they're degrading uh, what they're saying about America, and as a result, uh, many of our people have again become dispirited and uh, worried about what's going on. And we have the situation where, uh, for a period of time now, we've had district attorneys around the country uh, who have uh, actually stopped uh, really dealing with the crime problem and dealing with criminals. They've been either not prosecuting criminals or other uh, not sending prison, prison, uh, serious uh, criminals uh, to prison. So as a result, we have carjacking, we have uh, uh, mass uh, robberies, uh, go, going into uh, stores, particularly stores where expensive items are sold, and literally uh, intimidating the, the owners, uh, grab them, uh, snapping with uh, smash and grabs, and running out with the, all the stolen goods, and getting away before the police can get there, in a similar situation where crime is, uh, is rampant again. Uh, like where it was during the 1980s before the efforts were made to stop it. It seems like right now what we're seeing is that people who are criminals and doing the kind of activity that you mentioned are are kind of being given a free get out of jail get out of jail card right. and yet the same prosecutors many of them some of them are using the position of power that they have to in weaponizing that position of power against Trump and his allies. And we're seeing that in Fulton County, Georgia, where uh, the Atlanta area where I'm from, in Washington, D.C., in Florida, in New York, and then not just with Trump, but his, his allies in, in Wisconsin, in Nevada, and Arizona as well. Yes. Uh, today we have uh, I have the, what you might call the criminal, the uh, the uh, politicization uh, of criminal activity, and he certainly had the, the crime as a backdrop to much of the which, to ways in which the, the criminal law is being used as a political gambit to uh, deal with with uh, with some of the people who are running for office. And what do you think of that weaponization? of those positions? I think the idea that the criminal law should be used as a tool for uh, one political party uh, against another uh, is a serious problem for politics that we haven't had before. There's always been a respect uh, for uh, people running in the opposite party before, even, and even though there would be a discussion and arguments on issues in which they would be very seriously, uh, felt very seriously, and that sort of thing, which they, but they argued them out and they didn't try to put their opponents in jail. Yeah, and it's, it's very alarming what we're seeing today with. It's, it's, it's very, it's particularly serious today, and it, it, it poisons the politics the political situation, as well as makes it much harder for the people to understand and to be able to, to measure what they want in an election when the whole the process has been politicized and poisoned, really, uh, by the way in which the, the criminal law is being brought to use against uh, some of the opponents. Shifting gears for for just a minute, 
you you went through from from the time you first met Reagan, he became governor, or he was governor when you met him. Uh, he became president, and his legacy is one to to take down the the Soviet Union. What did you think when the Berlin Wall came down? Where were you? I was at the Heritage Foundation, and it, it, many of us who had worked with Ronald Reagan I mean, recognized the fact that uh, freedom was, was now beginning to triumph over the tyranny that the Soviet Union had been engaged in. And it seemed probably in 1976 and 1980 like that would be an impossibility. Right. I, and I think that when people today look at the challenges that our country faces, whether it's a weaponization of of the government against Trump and his allies, uh, the the stagnant economy, the threat of China, whatever these these challenges that we're facing are that seem so insurmountable and as if we can never get past them, we've gotten past, we've we've accomplished amazing things as a country in the past, seemingly impossible things, and it can be done again with the right leadership. Ronald Reagan was asked back in the 1970s uh, how he could change things uh, and how he could deal with the seriousness of the Soviet Union as it seemed to be making inroads into country after country around the world. And he said, uh, it's simple. Uh, we win, they lose. Now, he was not just being uh, boisterous or, or being uh, s uh, similar. He actually believed that freedom and uh, the kinds of principles that he believed in and which he had used in California, uh, principles like individual liberty, uh, free market economics, and so on, he really believed that these things could work, and very few people could, and almost everyone felt that we were that we were uh, relegated to having to uh, look look with uh, and, and compete with the Soviet Union as a, a constant opponent for years to come, and that there was no way of overcoming this. Ronald Reagan, of course, felt, felt differently, and went and then rebuilt our military and encouraged the building of our military forces in other countries that were free countries. And as a result, uh, all of the efforts that he made and the example he set for the world resulted in the end of the Soviet Union and uh, a return of freedom to many of those countries in, in Europe, which had been under the Soviet domination for so many years. Do you have any closing words that you would give to people who are getting involved in politics today for the first time, or for attorneys who are thinking of taking on the challenges that we face today? To people today, particularly young people, I think there is a great opportunity to follow the principles that Ronald Reagan espoused both uh, b before he ran for the governorship and as he continued throughout the time that he was governor, and which are the kinds of things that the Heritage Foundation, for example, stands for, uh, things like individual liberty, free market economics, and a strong national defense, all of which are, were the things that Ronald Reagan believed in, which he practiced as a leader, both before he was uh, governor, uh, as a governor, and then later as president. And uh, so I think that there's uh, much opportunity for hope, but it has to do with working on uh, uh, bringing back the United States that Ronald Reagan worked for and remembering the principles that he followed. And I think if we would do that, I think we would be in much better shape and in better shape not only for our country, but really better shape for the, world, for the free world. 
And me, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate this time we had together. Thank you. The Jenny Beth Show is hosted by Jenny Beth Martin, produced by Kevin Mooneyhan, and directed by Luke Livingston. The Jenny Beth Show is a production of Tea Party Patriots Action. For more information, visit TeaPartyPatriots.org. If you like this episode, let me know by hitting the like button or leaving a comment or a five-star review. And if you want to be the first to know every time we drop a new episode, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for whichever platform you're listening on. If you do these simple things, it will help the podcast grow, and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much.